So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's Re joint RAL ACOM seminar. So thanks to those of you who are attending here in the room and also those of you who are attending virtually. And for, the, for our virtual attendees, um, if you scroll down in your browser window, there should be a Slido panel uh, below that where you can ask questions uh, after the seminar. So we'll be monitoring for, for those questions and hopefully have questions coming in from both in person and online. Uh, and also just uh, if you are interested in giving a RAL seminar in the future or have a visitor coming uh, who, who would be a good candidate for a RAL seminar, just uh, please email me, contact me, and I can uh, help, get that, help get that scheduled and arranged. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce today's three speakers, not just one, but three. Uh, so our, um, Rajesh Kumar is a project scientist with NCAR here in Boulder. He has about 17 years of experience in air quality monitoring and forecasting, chemical data assimilation, field campaign analysis, and interacting with the air quality forecasters and managers. He is one of the lead developers of the Delhi Air Quality Early Warning System and NCAR CONUS Experimental Air Quality Forecasting System. He is also the founder and co-chair of the international project called Monitoring, Analysis, and Prediction of Air Quality, or MAP-AQ, that has been accepted as a core project by the World Meteorological Organization and is an activity by the International Global Atmospheric Chemistry Project. Also speaking today is Forrest Lacey. Forrest is a project scientist with a joint position between RAL and ACOM uh, with a degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Colorado. His research focus has been interdisciplinary topics, specifically developing and linking atmospheric models to societally relevant metrics and outcomes, where at NCAR he has revitalized a group focused on the intersections of climate, weather, and health. And uh, third, Jennifer Baynert. Uh, so Jen is the GIS co or GIS coordinator for UCAR. She is a geographer, and over the past 20 years, she has been leading and participating in the research on new geospatial technologies and methodologies for the integration of atmospheric data with traditional GIS data and analysis tools. So I guess, Rajesh, you're starting out. So the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Jared. And uh, thank you all for coming in person to listen to this seminar. Uh, as you can see that we three are presenting it, uh, which means uh, there has been a lot of coordination that was required in carrying out this project. And um, it has there has been a lot of contribution from other people. So you see the list of co-authors here. Um, it's a long list going between RAL and ACOM. Some of these colleagues have even moved out of RAL. So what we are going to present today has been the work of past three years. Um, so I would also like to acknowledge uh, the ECMAP grant from NASA, which supported uh, this work. So we are going to be speaking in three parts. Uh, first, I will be talking about the motivation for this work and the uh, description of the air quality reanalysis, which is the basis of this air quality dashboard. It will be followed by Forrest, who will be talking about the health and agricultural impact analysis, which is one of the products in the dashboard. And then Jen will finally be, uh, will be showing us some of the features of this dashboard. So I know that uh, means um, a lot of you are familiar with air pollution, but I anticipated there are some people in the audience who are, do not know much about air pollution. So I want to start with this question, what is really air pollution? And so it represents the presence of chemicals and particles in the atmosphere above a certain threshold. That is the, very, the most important part. These chemicals and particles, these are always present in the atmosphere. They were there before humans came to the planet. And these are necessary for our survival on the planet. But when these chemicals and particles exceed a particular threshold, that's when the air quality becomes a problem. So above that threshold, these chemicals and particles causes uh, health hazards and damages ecosystems. So this threshold is different depending on the country you are in, depending on the agency that you are looking at. So for example, in the US, uh, Environmental Protection Agency defines this threshold, um, and there are many pollutants, but ozone and particulate matter uh, less than 2.5 microns in diameter are the two most important criteria pollutants. Um, 
And the threshold uh, for maximum daily eight hour average ozone is 50 parts per billion. When I say parts per billion, it means that on an eight hour average, if there are more than 50 molecules of ozone in one billion molecules of air, it's a problem. So you can see how small they are, but their impacts are disproportionately larger on health. And for, for PM2.5, it is uh, 35 micrograms per meter cube in terms of daily average. Air pollutants, these can be emitted either directly to the atmosphere, say for example, from the cars, from industries, from residential activities, from agricultural activities. So all these sources contribute to the pollutant direct emissions. And these, uh, that's why they are called primary pollutants. But then when these emissions go into the atmosphere, they react with each other in the presence of sunlight, and they also make secondary pollutants. So air pollution is generally categorized in, in the form of primary and secondary pollutants. Ozone is a secondary pollutant, which means it is not directly emitted into the atmosphere. PM2.5 have contribution from both the primary and secondary sources. And uh, this is just a number showing the damages air pollution does in the US. So the premature deaths associated with uh, health impacts from air pollution is about 160,000. And economic loss in terms of the lives lost in terms of the missed work and uh, health infrastructure cost, that is about 175 billion per year. So it's, it's a big problem um, for the US and also for other countries uh, in the world. So how do we really address this problem? Um, so there are many things, uh, we, have, we hear so many things about the regulations and everything, but generally it comes down to these three steps when, when it comes to dis, dis, uh, defining a framework to address the air pollution problem. So everything always starts with measurements. Those are the fundamental blocks of our knowledge. And this starts with laboratory measurements, then we go out in the field, we measure it. And in the recent years, we have developed multiple platforms like aircraft, satellites, uh, ships, and, and balloons. So all these measurements, these are the basis of our fundamental knowledge. And then we turn that knowledge into mathematical equations. And these mathematical equations then become the basis of our numerical models. And at NCAR, we, we do a lot of work in both these areas, in, in observations and models. Models can be multi-dimensions, dimensional, and these are used for a variety of purposes, like for air quality early warnings, for air quality reanalysis, for projecting future changes in air quality. So all that information that is coming out from models, because models also allow you to turn on and off sources, so they provide then information for uh, the policy making. And the policymakers then take that information, they design and implement policies, and then we go back to the measurements to see whether those policies are working or not. But the question is, observations cannot be performed anywhere. Uh, it is, these require a lot of human resources. We also need a lot of money to have a sensor everywhere. So they cannot be performed everywhere. In fact, as of now, nearly 42 million Americans live in unmonitored areas. So how, do we, how can we fill this gap? And one thing that we can do is we can combine the information from models with the observations to come up with gridded estimates of long-term changes in air pollution. And that's what we have done in this project. But why it is important to integrate models with observations? We have models, we can run them, and we can get the gridded information anywhere we want. But we know that the models, these are numerical representations of the reality. And by their design, they suffer from errors and biases due to various things, which includes errors in initial conditions, uncertainties in input emissions, and poor understanding of some of the processes that control air quality. And chemical data assimilation, so when we say data assimilation, it is really a framework to bring together models and observations. And here I'm showing one example from a study that we did in 2019. Uh, in black, we have daily observed PM2.5 over the US, over the corners actually. And in red, we have the model prediction from the community multi-scale air quality model without assimilation of observations. And you can see that we are underestimating the black line. And then in the blue curve, we have the same CMAC model, but now we assimilate the aerosol optical depth retrievals from the MODIS satellite 
and you can see that it is pushing the model towards observations. So although we do not get rid of all the errors, but when we combine the model and observations, we have the possibility of improving the accuracy of our model results, which then leads to a better confidence of policymakers into our model results. So this was really the, in the motivation for uh, writing the proposal for this project. We use these results as the basis, and we said we see improvement at one, one month time scale. What can we develop a data set for like a long term by assimilating more than a decade of NASA observations into the CMAX system. And so we decided to do uh, a 14 year air quality reanalysis where we assimilate MODIS AOD and MOPIT CO every day uh, into CMAX. So this is our model domain and configuration. We use the WARF CMAX model, WARF version 4.1.2, CMAX version 5.3.2. The data assimilation system is GI GSI, um, and we assimilate, as I said, MODIS AOD and MOPIT CO. The resolution is 12 by 12 kilometers square with 35 vertical levels uh, from surface to 50 hectopascal. Um, ERA interim is used to provide meteorological initial and boundary conditions. VACAM was used to provide chemical initial and boundary condition. So this is a new capability that we developed in this project. So before this, uh, there was no coupling between VACAM and CMAC, and study period is uh, 2005 to 2018. Now, how are we doing this? Because the, when we look at these satellite data, there are different times at which the satellites see different parts of the US. So you look at the Terra and Aqua satellite retrievals, and they cover the US between 15 and 21 UTC. And there is a three hour time difference between Terra and Aqua. So what we decided is we are going to do a simulation every three hours. And so basically every day, what we need to do we need to run our CMAC model from 0Z to 15Z, which is when the first satellite overpass is coming over the US. And so we stop the model. Then we assimilate both the MODIS AOD and MOPIT CO. We do it sequentially in two different jobs. And then we improve our chemical state in the CMAC model through the assimilation. Then we again run the model for three hours, 15 to 18, and we again stop the model, assimilate the satellite data, then go from 18 to 21, stop the model, again assimilate and go from 21 to 24. So that resulted in 12 jobs per day on Cheyenne. And if, I, if we have to do it manually, we can just be doing this for three years uh, because that resulted in a total of 61,536 jobs. So we came up with a automated dependent job submission system. And using that system, we could submit one month worth of job in like five seconds. And that's how we, uh, we run this system. Um, very quickly, some uh, key elements of the, the chemical data simulation. So basically, uh, in the three-dimensional variational system, we try to minimize this cost function, which is uh, really finding an optimal state uh, that is the closest to the observed state as represented by this equation and the model state. Um, sorry, this, this one represents the model, and this one represents the observations. There are four important variables in this equation, analysis variables, which is like when you are assimilating AOD and carbon monoxide, in response to that, what model variables are going to be affected, which is our total aerosol mass per mod and carbon monoxide. Forward operator, we know that the models simulate aerosol chemical composition. The satellite observes AOD. So we need to go from chemical composition to the AOD space. This process is called forward operator. Um, we also need the errors because the data simulation system does not directly push the model value to the observed value. It looks at the balance between errors in the model and errors in the observation and determines what an opti optimal increment to the model is. And then the background error of the model, um, in our case, we uh, take into account the anthropogenic and biomass burning emission uncertainties in the design of those errors. I showed you the, the result from the MODIS AOD assimilation in the first slide, uh, first few slides. Then we wanted to look whether the MOPIT CO assimilation is working. So we look at uh, the vertical distribution. So here you see 10 pressure levels. These are the MOPIT retrieval levels. Um, red is our background experiment without assimilation. Blue is our experiment with assimilation. So you look at correlation coefficient at most of the levels is increasing compared to the background experiment with assimilation 
mean bias and root mean square error are decreasing except around the 100 hectopascal, which is where the satellite has a very low sensitivity. Also, it has a low sensitivity at the surface. So basically, it's, it's kind of a sanity check that our model, the assimilation system, is actually pushing the model state towards the observed state. But then how, do we are, how are we comparing with the, um, with the observations? So we, because it's a regional system, we do not expect our system to capture everything that is happening in the urban areas. So we look at the performance of our system at regional scale. And we follow the EPA region definition uh, for the evaluation of our meteorological parameters and uh, air quality simulations. So this slide here shows uh, in the 10 EPA regions, so this is like R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, R6, 7, 8, 9, 10, for temperature here, relative humidity and wind speed. Um, in black, we have the observation from METAR network. In red, we have our WARF model from 2005 to 2018. And you can see that, okay, of course, as exp we expect, we get the best performance for temperature, then the relative humidity. We also have a very good performance. And for winds, we know that WARF has this tendency to overestimate the wind speeds. But in general, the model is able to capture the regional and interannual variability in all these meteorological parameters. Then we look at uh, ozone and PM2.5. Again, um, this plot we need to update because right now it is from 2005 to 2016. Um, but you can see that the seasonal cycles of ozone and PM2.5, in, for ozone, we have, a, we have much better performance compared to PM2.5 where we have problems in region 8, 9, and 10. And these are the regions that belong to the Western US, and which is where we are experiencing the most wildfires. And we know that our wildfires emission inventories are the most uncertain. The uncertainty in the anthropogenic emission is of the order of about 100 to 200%. In wildfire emissions, it could be up, up to 3,000%. 3, so that's how uncertain the wildfire emission inventories are. Um, but in terms of ozone, we have a correlation coefficient of 0.75 to 0.9 across all regions. Mean bias is about 4 to 6 ppb. Um, and then we, we, we do see, again, uh, large biases in the regions 8 and 9 because of the wildfires. Then we also try to see, OK, we have biases in our model, but are we capturing the trend? So in the United States, we have implemented policies over the last 20 years to control the emissions. So are those, can we see those policies in our data set? And does our model capture what we see in our uh, observations? So here, we take two metrics again, the MDA8 ozone and 24-hour PM2.5. And if you see here a dark blue color, it means that it is a statistically significant decreasing trend. If it is a light blue color, it is statistically insignificant decreasing trend. And the same thing for the positive trends. So the dark red means in statistically significant increasing. Um, light red means statistically insignificant increasing. So we, this panel above here, it is only for the summertime ozone, because that's when most of the time uh, ozone exceeds the national ambient air quality standard. And the bottom is for 24-hour annual average PM2.5. Now, we are doing very well over the eastern US, uh, but we start to see some problems, especially for particulate matter um, in the, in the, again in the northwest US, which is again very much affected by wildfires. So you see that in the observations, there are some sites showing a mix of trends. Some sites show statistically insignificant increasing. Some show decreasing. In our case, it is mostly statistically significant uh, decreasing. So it looks like in the model, it is driven too strongly by the trends in anthropogenic emissions. But otherwise, I think at more than 80% of the sites uh, across the US, our data set is able to capture the trends in air quality. So with this, I like to hand it over to Forrest to tell us about health and agriculture impact analysis. Uh, thank you, Rajesh. <clears throat> So um, the, the justification that we're using for exploring kind of air quality, health, and um, agricultural impacts is that we know air pollution has an impact on human health. 
Um, and there's different ways to estimate that. So, so I'm just going to give a brief introduction about the metrics that we use to investigate human health. Um, and, and as Rajesh mentioned in the uh, introduction, around 160,000 deaths annually in the U.S., along with many more non-mortality-related uh, impacts are on human health due to ambient air pollution. And this is basically the, the baseline exposure response function, or, or how we estimate impacts for a specific outcome. Um, so we have a specific outcome that we're interested in here, and it's iterated over different causes and different regions, and it takes into account both the, the population in that region and the baseline incidence rate in that region as well. And then where air quality comes in is in this term here, which is the relative risk, or, or what is the risk associated with ambient air quality? And so these metrics are all determined through the use of cohort studies. Um, this is probably one of the initial ones done for uh, air pollution. It's called the Six City Study. And kind of the outcome from this is these functions here that show um, your hazard ratio or relative risk as a function of concentrations of an individual pollutant. So here, what we're kind of showing on, on the side here is the hazard ratio as a function of PM 2.5 exposure. And these, these cohort studies are, are 14 to 20 year studies um, that kind of track air pollution and health outcomes in an individual region. And so, What's being kind of shown here is you get average relative risk for a specific region um, through what's called population weighting. And that's you take the population in an individual grid cell um, divided by the, multiplied by the relative risk for that particular grid cell uh, divided by the total population in that area. And that's population weighting. That's done with relative risks, but it can also be done with pollutant concentrations. And then this is where the pollutant concentrations come into play when we're looking at ambient air quality. Um, these functions are the ones that I just showed that are determined by cohort studies. So if we're looking at what are the impacts of air quality on human health, uh, we want to look at, okay, what are these relative risk terms, which we know are a function of the population weighted uh, concentrations. So that's what we're show showing here in kind of the next slides is the population weighted concentrations which don't follow the trends in um, concentrations of specific pollutants themselves because they also take into account things like population shift from urban to rural areas or rural to urban areas um, or moving between states. So it's these metrics are a combined impact of both the atmospheric concentrations and societal changes. And so this is basically a, a graphical representation of how we're creating these metrics. Uh, so if we're interested in the population weighted PM 2.5 for this black outer grid cell, uh, we have high resolution population data in that grid cell. And we also have high resolution concentration data in that grid cell. So we multiply those two arrays by each other, divide by the total population in the domain, and that gives us the population weighted PM 2.5 is what I'm going to be showing in these uh, next couple slides. And this is a representation of the relative risk. And so first I wanted to show um, kind of trends conus wide. Uh, and this is what Rajesh was kind of talking about where we're capturing the trends at 80% of the EPA AQS sites. Um, this is now looking at how population weighted PM 2.5 has changed throughout the study period. So starting here in 2005, going out to the end of 2018. And we basically have this trend line here where we're estimating that we're getting around a reduction of 0.3 micrograms per meter squared per year. And, and this is great. Um, that's a, a very big factor in terms of what the health outcomes are. Um, we want to see these types of reductions. So what we've done is instead of looking at this at a conus wide level, uh, we've broken it down into the EPA regions and then into the county level aggregations. And so that's what we've done here. Um, these are now county aggregated metrics of population weighted PM 2.5. And the trends that I'm showing here is taking a three year average of the beginning of the time period, uh, 2005 through 2007 and subtracting out the, the three-year average at the end of the time period. So I've looked at this in two different ways. I'll show the, the other way um, 
kind of in, in some other plots later. But if you look at this specific metric, you can kind of see uh, an overall, a general decrease in most of the regions. Um, but we do get some specific increases um, kind of here uh, in Nevada, um, also in kind of the northern and Rocky Mountain regions, um, and then in the Denver metro area. And we're still trying to identify the specific causes for these, um, but in general, these seem to be tied to uh, wildfire-related regions and oil and gas extraction regions. And then one thing that we see in the Pacific Northwest is if it's wildfires, we would expect to see a large increasing trend in the Pacific Northwest. Um, but what basically happened with this is uh, the period that I looked at, 2005 through 2007, was actually a very high wildfire activity year. So through this specific metric, we don't really see that PM 2.5 signal. And then also in the plots that Rajesh showed, um, you saw that we have a much higher uh, misrepresentation of wildfire emissions in the early period. Um, and that's due to how satellite emissions are created. And there was basically a shift in uh, how MODIS estimates wildfire activity um, that happened around, I think, 2009. Um, so this beginning period had a different methodology for how wildfire emissions are input into the model. Now, similarly, we've done uh, an ex uh, a similar experiment with ozone, again, aggregating to the county level and comparing the first three years of simulation to the last three years of simulation. And here, uh, we don't see a stark of a decrease in ozone as we do in PM 2.5. Um, one thing that we do know is that as uh, we have, in general, more warming, specifically summertime warming, we do see higher ozone concentrations. So this makes sense, where PM 2.5 is not as tied to general climate change. But again, we see um, larger changes in kind of the northern US, um, again, with hot spots uh, both in um, the Denver metro area and then also the Pacific Northwest. Um, this is tied to uh, wildfire activity and again, oil and gas. We see again, uh, Salt Lake City as well. Um, but the other kind of thing that you start to see here specifically with ozone is you see many of the metropolitan statistical areas starting to pop up. So anytime you see these little green spots here, um, that's due to cities in that area and basically more people moving to the area and we're getting higher ozone concentrations or we're shifting the regime for ozone production. So the second way I've kind of looked at this is now instead of looking at the first three years and the last three years, I, I've calculated a linear trend line for the entire time period for each one of the counties. And that's what's being shown here on this plot. And now what we have is a population weighted PM 2.5 uh, linear trend uh, is shown on the X axis. And the y-axis is showing the population-weighted MDA8 ozone trend, again calculated for the entire time period. And what this is starting to show is that, uh, similar to the plots, uh, most of the regions have a decreasing uh, PM2.5 trend uh, with a very small amount that have an increasing PM2.5 trend. Um, again, it's hard to see the colors, but almost all of these are in the uh, Rocky Mountain region. Um, so could be tied to wildfire, could be tied to oil and grass, gas extraction. Um, but we do see that ozone is becoming a more relevant pollutant uh, versus PM 2.5. We typically have decreasing PM 2.5 concentrations, um, but more areas have worsening ozone air quality. Uh, so this has some specific impacts uh, relevant to policymakers and to mitigation efforts. In Working with policy relevant metrics, um, they are not specifically tied to uh, the concentrations that I showed before. Um, the policy relevant metrics that the EPA monitors are things like W126, which is an integrated exposure uh, concentration. So basically, uh, the daytime, uh, the sum of the daytime max ozone for a number of months. Uh, for three months out of the year, so the highest three months out of the year, the integrated exposure uh, throughout basically 7 a.m. to 7 or 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, that's what's called the W126, and W126 is a metric that's specifically tied to crop yield um, because basically ozone impacts 
of the stomata of the plant and can any reactive oxidative species will impact uh, the pho photosynthesis and then also in turn affect the crop yield. Um, so this is a specific metric similar to the health metrics that's tied to physical outcomes. And then for the policy relevant metrics for ozone, um, they're looking at the National Ambient Air Quality Standard, MDA8, uh, which is not directly the MDA8 concentration. It's the fourth highest max for a specific region uh, in a specific year. Um, and again, I've kind of showed how this is tied to health impacts through cohort studies. And so now looking at the maps of um, ozone exposure trends, um, this is looking at W126, which is a crop valid one, um, the MDA8 concentrations I showed on the previous plots. But here you start to see is this is not tied to, to population, um, but more tied to daytime integrated exposure. Uh, we, we have very different areas. Um, I'm just going to cycle back to this real quick. Just so, to remind you, this is basically we see large reductions in the southeast, but that's not as marked in the integrated exposure metric because we're seeing a larger integrated exposure. So depending on what metric you're interested in, this really has an impact on what function uh, or what mitigation effort you're trying to make uh, looking forward. You could do something that integrates, that decreases your MDAA concentrations, but has little to no impact on your W126 metric. So this is something that should be considered by policymakers moving forward. And then similarly, we've plotted uh, the scatter plot of county level trends. This is again the linear trend line um, for both health, uh, health relevant policy metric and agricultural relevant policy metric. And in general here, you can see again, there's, there's not that many, if you're looking at this linear trend, there's not that many sites that have a worsening um, agricultural policy W126 metric, um, but we do have a much wider spread of counties that have worsening ambient air quality uh, when we're looking at ozone. Um, so again, this analysis should point policymakers to have a, a better understanding of what mitigation efforts uh, can try and achieve specific results. And one thing that I'd like to note as well is that both of these metrics, the W126 and the uh, ozone concentrations, are up for review uh, every couple of years. And I think both of the panels are actually meeting right now or have provided recommendations for updated metrics uh, to these. So this is kind of a really timely analysis as to show, okay, this is what the trend has been. And potentially uh, with forecasting efforts, we can predict, okay, what what counties will be in attainment or what counties will not be in attainment um, in the future. And so all of these metrics uh, have been calculated and I've basically passed them off to Jen to put into a public informational dashboard and I believe that's what she's gonna discuss next. Great, yeah. Thank you, Forrest. So, I'm gonna talk about dissemination of this information um, out to the public and out to um, our public health sectors. So it was back in 2004, Stephen Few defined um, a dashboard as a uh, visual display of the most important information needed to achieve one or more objectives. It also was defined as a cons consolidating and arranging everything on one single screen so the information can be monitored at a glance. 13 years later, the big book of dashboards um, simplified this uh, definition to say a dashboard is a visual display of data used to monitor conditions and um, facilitate understanding. And so I like to think of a dashboard as having the right information uh, on the right medium, uh, geared towards the right audience in order for them to understand it in the shortest amount of time. Esri is one of the largest GIS software uh, companies in the world, and they have created this ArcGIS dashboard. And how the ArcGIS dashboard differs from other dashboards is that it is location-based analytics. Um, so all of the different elements on the dashboards um, are centered around a map feature. So we'll have some maps, we'll have some graphs, we'll have some charts. 
And this example of this dashboard is probably one of the most popular dashboards. It's John Hopkins University COVID-19 dashboard, which many of you probably saw during the pandemic. And it was really used to monitor um, cases and deaths throughout the world, as well as uh, within the US. And they were using the ArcGIS dashboard um, platform. We use the ArcGIS dashboard platform to create our air quality dashboard. And here we're disseminating the air quality information that um, Rajesh and Forrest just explained to you. Uh, we've aggregated everything at a state and a county level for this dashboard. And we're really gearing this dashboard towards the public health sector um, as well as the general public. Um, on this dashboard, we are distributing um, information about um, the maximum eight hour ozone, PM 2.1, PM 1, PM 10, and nitrogen dioxide. On this dashboard, you can see there's a lot of different elements. So on the very left, we have a couple lists. We have state and county lists. Right in the center panel, we have a time series of those 14 year period, um, ag aggregated at the annual average. We also underneath that have something called an indicator, which is just kind of a, a summary number that pops up um, about different um, thresholds being met and exceeded. We of course have our map, on the right, which is interactive, and bar charts. So a lot of different elements that are all integrated together and that all work together based on your selections. So since maps are pretty integral to all dashboards, as I mentioned, these maps are really interactive. So you can zoom in, zoom out, pan around on these maps. Um, as you zoom in past a certain extent, counties will pop up and states will turn off. On the left-hand side are number of years, so you can select the year that you want to see the data for. Along the bottom is also the different um, variables or tracers that we have mapped. So in the top rung of um, maps, we have ozone, um, eight-hour maximum ozone, aggregated uh, for the state at an annual level. Uh, we've selected 2005, 2010, 2015, or sorry, 2015, so you can see kind of how the, um, how the trends have changed over the years on a map. And on the bottom rung, we've then selected PM 2.5 for the similar years. And again, you can just kind of see by selecting the different years how the trends um, of the concentration has changed over time. Also within the maps, you can select on any of the states and a pop-up will show up and a little more information will come up um, for that particular area that you've selected. Now, when we expect people to be navigating this dashboard, everything's going to be geared towards those lists on the left-hand side. So if a user comes in and selects um, a state, so in this case, Indiana, then the county list will populate with all the counties for that particular state. Once they select a county, such as Marion County, then all of their elements are going to reflect information for that particular county. So in this case, for Marion County, we see that um, the time series for the 14-year period for PM 2.5 is mapped. Um, the map on the right-hand side, in this case, I've selected 2015. So it zooms into the county, and you can select which year you want to uh, visualize the data for. At the bottom, for the indicator, it comes up with those 14-year period. How many days within that 14-year period has exceeded the threshold of 35 micrograms um, per meter cubed? And then on the right-hand side, that bar chart, instead of just having the big number, which is kind of hard to understand, it goes year by year, how many days for every year for those 14-year period um, exceeded this particular threshold. So our indicator and our bar chart are linked together to better understand that information. So how, I, how we envision people using this um, dashboard is through, we can show it through a few different use cases. So this first one's gonna be taking a look at wildfires in California. So wildfires lead to deterioration in air quality. I mean, here in Colorado, as we've seen in the past few years, right, when we've had our big fires in Colorado, we've been having worse air quality. And then in the past week with the wildfires in Canada, we're definitely uh, feeling the, uh, the air quality and the smoke coming down from Canada. Uh, wildfires release organic material, fine particular matter, um, as well as pollutants that can form ozone. In California, um, they experienced some really devastating wildfires in the years 2008 and in 2018. The bottom two uh, charts, um, courtesy of Shima Sham, shows us, based on MODIS burn area, um, how many, the one on the right is how many areas have been burnt 
um, based on the land cover. So we can definitely see that in 2008, there's a spike of how many areas, um, how many area has been burnt. And we can see also that most of that area was evergreen forests. And then if you take a look at 2018, we also see a large number of area burnt um, in California. The map on the right for that same time period, and this is 2001 to 2018, we can definitely see over there the fire, the fire perimeters um, symbolized based on the land cover um, that the area was burnt. And we see that in Northern California, there was a lot of fires in that time and a lot of the fires that burnt in the um, evergreen forest area. So talking about Northern California, if we zoom into Shasta County, which is in Northern California, and it has a population of around 180,000, um, back in 2008, um, they actually called June the June fire siege because over 1.2 million acres burnt um, in Shasta and in the neighboring um, Trinity County. You can see that Shasta County is that symbolized in that black line and it's got Redding kind of as the center um, town in there. And on the right hand map, you can definitely see all the different fire perimeters and they are symbolized based on area burnt within those fire perimeters. Also in 2018, uh, the car fire burnt within Shasta County. It burnt over 230,000 acres. Um, and we just see uh, these fires large, large fires burning a large amount of area. So these two years, let's see in the dashboard if we can see um, what the air quality trends were um, within the dashboard based on the data. So again, I'm navigating through California and then into Chasta County. If I take a look at the uh, time series, we definitely see for ozone a spike in 2008 and a spike back in 2018. So we can see kind of the air quality being affected by those large fires in that Northern California area. Um, on the map, we can see um, that definitely we are in the, the dark purple, which is the higher levels of ozone. And then when we take a look at our bar charts, again, that's where we can see the number of days in 2008 and in 2018 um, exceeded the, um, the threshold of 70 ppbs, um, which is the healthy, um, healthy threshold for ozone um, for a day, for a 24-hour period. If we look at the PM 2.5, which is another um, uh, another uh, very, uh, pollutant that gets admitted from wildfires, we can also see the spikes for 2008 and for 2018. And we also see the bar chart. We can see those spike in the number of days where it's exceeded the threshold of 35 um, for those two years. So we can definitely use this um, dashboard in order to see some different types of um, phenomena that happen and um, natural hazards that happened for our air quality. Let's take a look at the use case for policy. And again, I'm gonna be staying in California um, and I'm looking at Los Angeles County here. So over the years, uh, we definitely know that Los Angeles County hasn't had the cleanest air over the years, but California has been implementing some pretty strict regulations on emissions. Um, so let's see if we can see any trends in their air quality, um, perhaps based on some of their regulations that they've been implementing. And here by choosing Los Angeles County, for ozone, we definitely see a downward trend over this 14-year period. We also see a downward trend within the number of days that have exceeded the threshold for ozone. And if we select um, P, uh, PM 2.5, we also can again see that downward trend for our time series for the concentration of PM 2.5 over this 14-year period. And we also see that downward trend in our, um, in our days exceeding um, the threshold of 35 micrograms um, per meter cubed. So we've also uh, developed a data download dashboard. So the dashboard that I showed you before is really kind of a dashboard to investigate the data, um, move around, select around. But if you wanted to actually access the data in a usable format as a CSV file, we've developed this streamlet um, dashboard, which is developed in all open source, uh, written in Python. And in this particular dashboard, we're using the same data underneath. Um, users can come in and select a time period of interest, uh, temporal aggregation, um, air quality tracers, even one or, or multiple, um, statistics, as well as a geographic extent. And once they've selected all of this, 
The data on the fly will be converted from the traditional ZAR format, which is what it's being stored at on, um, on disk, to a CSV. It will be extracted, it will be aggregated, um, and available as a CSV file. We've also added some plotting uh, mechanisms so you can kind of see the data that you've selected first before you decide to download it. Um, but it's a nice way to be able to um, distribute this information in CSV. Most people can't use NetCDF or SAR files, but they, but they love CSVs. So a nice way to be able to get that data into people's hands um, where they can slice and dice and aggregate the data based on what they would like. So in summary, um, the air quality reanalysis uh, developed by the WARF CMAC GSI system captures the trends in both the weather patterns and air quality in most parts of the U.S. reasonably well. Um, we're using the WARF CMAC GSI data um, so that we can explore regional and temporal trends in societally relevant metrics to identify regions that are improving and those that are worsening. And using dashboards, be it the ArcGIS dashboard or the Streamlit dashboard, are great ways to disseminate and communicate complex information in a straightforward manner. And with that, um, we're happy to take questions. Thank you. So do we have any questions in the room? Carl. Jennifer, of course you know that ozone in Netherlands and in Niwot is going to be different, but they're all in Boulder County, which is not a real huge county. Uh, can you zoom in at the sub-county level? So, uh, so, so, in, so as we had mentioned, this data is originally in a 12 kilometer by 12 kilometer grid. So we have aggregated the data on the county level um, based on the um, the grid cell, what county that grid cell, what county the grid cells fall within the county. You can zoom into a city. I mean, and in that data download, you can select a city. Um, but if that city, like if Nederland and Boulder are within a 12 kilometer radius, then you're going to get the same values there. So the data is not defined, it's not um, specific enough in its spatial resolution to really define too much of a difference um, because the underlying data is at the 12 kilometer resolution. Just as a, another answer for that, Carl, the, um, the raw data is also publicly available. So if you would like that more discretized version, um, we are providing the raw WARF CMAC GSI data um, for the entire time period. So if you're interested in ozone, we can give you a net CDF that has um, all of those data points for the entire time series. Um, we've aggregated it to daily, but uh, we can do hourly for special requests. So that is available, um, but it's not through the nifty dashboards that Jen has created. And I have a correction. In the first slide, I showed the threshold for ozone is 50 ppb, which is a WHO standard. In the US, it is actually 70 ppb. <laughs> Hi. Um, so this is a really neat platform, and I like the way that you've linked all the pieces. Um, but I, I think I have a question that's related to Carl's. I was thinking about, you know, you motivated it by talking about not having great data coverage, right? And so this is a way you can get information no matter where you are. But in the US, for example, right, we have lots of surface, surface observations of things like PM 2.5. So I was curious if you've thought about also sort of integrating or, you know, um, assimilating that data and then providing some metric for where anyone is based on like the, how much data are available, right? Because in some cases, you might be better off downloading the, the, your station's PM 2.5 data, right, rather than using something like this. So it means we did not assimilate the ground-based data on purpose because we wanted to keep this, this as an independent verification data set. Because if we would have assimilated the ground-based observation, we would have automatically looked good so that we kept that data set as an independent verification so that we can we understand what are the uncertainties and we are going to provide this evaluation together with this dashboard so that policymakers also know how much confidence they can put into this information uh, but yes means like we have another follow-on project uh, to this uh, in which we are going to 
use a strategy of like assimilating 50% of the observation, but then leaving the rest 50% uh, for independent verification. So that would it, it will be their assimilation would be very helpful. In this project, we did not do it on purpose. Yes, so I'll, I'll ask the online question, then hand it back to you. Uh, so Helen Kershaw online asks, can you share the link to the Streamlit dashboard? So how, how can people find this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm happy to share the link to that dashboard. We are in the process of, um, it is available externally. We are in the process of changing the URL to make it something um, a little more catchy than <laughs> uh, just the server name at the port number. Um, so we will be sh we will be sharing all this information um, on our GIS website, gis.ucar.edu. Um, and if Jared is able to help distribute any of this information when we get that, we'll do that as well. But but if you definitely go to gis.ucar.edu, once we have that URL set, we'll be um, sharing that information there. It seems like there's it seems like there's a lot of data manipulation, that computational loads, et cetera, in not only in your individual pieces, but how you actually integrate across all the components that you're bringing together. Was there, as you were developing this project, was there anything, you know, compromises, considerations that sort of surprised you? Or I would just be curious to know how that integration was, that did you have to change what you originally thought was gonna be the way you were gonna present the data or calculate the data because of the integration piece of it? Kind of an open-ended question. Yeah, means we, we did not have any challenge in producing this data set. Means all the WARF CMAC runs went pretty smoothly. Um, it was, but I would say that means like when we started this project, we had decade long experience in these models. And so we, we already have a background knowledge of what may or may not go wrong. And that experience really helped us. So the WARF CMAC runs were pretty smooth, um, but then I, I would let Forrest and Chen talk about their components. And I think that um, actually one of the strengths of this team that we've put together to work on this project is the ability to aggregate across scales. Um, and so Jen and the, the GIS team, Kevin and Matt and Olya, uh, they really helped us take gridded model output and calculate zonal statistics about that model output, and that's what's captured in the, um, in the dashboard. So, so that's a, a method that's uh, not GIS specific, but uh, is very done very well in GIS to calculate these zonal averages and these zonal metrics that um, aggregate the, the model output to, to a specific level. Um, so there is uncertainty in it, um, but it, it's done to kind of the most computationally uh, precise manner that we can do it with especially some of these counties are very odd shaped. As most of you know, Broomfield County is one of the weirdest shaped counties ever, but uh, we did the best we could with <laughs> the data and the, the odd shape of that county. Yeah, and I'll just add, um, of course, whenever there's a new model and we want to bring it into GIS, there's a lot of tweaking and working that we have to do. So um, so definitely working with Rajesh and Forrest and, and the rest of our GIS team, we were able to add a spatial component to this data so that we can bring it into GIS and we can put it on the earth exactly where we think it should be so that all of this work together. So, so based on, um, again, based on past experience working with other models, um, it was very successful. Yeah, Tom, I would also say that because, so this was a huge project, means, and we had limited resources and it's, it's easy to get distracted by just the volume of data, the things that you can do with this. So we had very regular communication across the team members to make sure that we, we precisely understand what each team member needs in order to do their things. And there is minimum duplication of efforts. Like if there is something that can be calculated in the GIS itself, we did not calculate it in the, in the post-processing of our data. So before I hand it over to Carl, I'll ask a question of my own. So in the dashboards, are you able to uh, select different thresholds? Because over time, many health agencies do uh, select more stringent, usually at least, increasingly stringent thresholds uh, for considering health effects. So, you know, if 
a health agency is, or, or concerned citizens, are interested in looking at, okay, well, what if we had this lower threshold, then how does that affect the trend? So in the dashboard, can you, or can a user select a different threshold? At the moment, that capability is not there, but that's a really interesting idea and something we can definitely, yeah, think about. But yeah, that's a great idea. But right now, we just have set those thresholds because that dashboard, all the data is pre-computed. Um, so we've set the dashboard for us actually calculated how many days that threshold was met or exceeded. So that was pre-calculated, but that would be an interesting um, thought. I would think with something like that with the um, streamlet, where you're actually getting that raw data, that is somewhere you know where it may not be that um, that difficult in Excel to then do your own calculations based on different thresholds. So there are some ways to do that, but that's a really interesting thought for future development. Yeah. Do you distinguish from ozone from anthropogenic sources and from stratospheric intrusions? That might be a, not a health but a regulatory issue. No, we do not distinguish between between the two, but we do account for both of those sources. Any other questions in the room? Um, I think uh, going back to the uh, Helen Kershaw's question, I think uh, I would recommend also uh, working with the NCAR UCAR communications office to um, get a press release together once you have the nice spiffy memorable URL especially. Um, and I, th I think that would be a great way and then you know, that could be advertised on uh, NCAR social media and things like that. And so we could get that out through multiple, multiple public channels once that's ready to go. Yeah, and so we already had a talk with the UCAR NCAR communication team with Ali, and I hope she's watching online. <laughs> <laughs> there is oh, one more question over here. Oh, Alan's on. <laughs> Sorry. I, um, it, this, oh, at least <laughs> this just reminded me. Um, so this seems like it would be particularly useful in a global context. So I'm curious if you've thought about doing this using a global model as well. Um, definitely, yes. I think it, it would be a worthwhile exercise to do it globally. As you know that at NCAR, we are developing now multi-scale models. Uh, so, for example, ACOM is leading the development of Musica model, uh, where you can zoom in over a particular reason, region, but you can run globally. So it will be, once we have that model ready, uh, it will be worthwhile repeating this exercise globally and uh, having a dashboard uh, go globally. Yes. All right. Well, Tom has one more. Do you need to answer it for me? Yes. Sure. So, yeah. Mobile app two. Websites, both, is there any thought about access? What, what you need to use access? Okay, so for the folks online, uh, Tom's question was, have you thought about uh, putting this out on mobile apps and webs, well, yep, yep. mobile apps and, uh, and, and smartphones, other platforms, et cetera? Um, you know, definitely with the technology, the technology is there to develop some mobile apps uh, of this type of dashboard. I think, um, you know, we haven't, that's not necessarily something that we have, have talked about, um, but that's definitely, the technology is there and it's, it's feasible to do. I think thinking about how to put all this complex information into a mobile app, right, or, or distributing things through text files, it just is kind of, or, it's just a, a thought of reducing the information that you're distributing so it's not coming overwhelming. So um, I think that's another great idea for future development. Um, I think it might just be thinking about what it is we want to present in that smaller type of interface. Yeah, that's a great idea though. The web groups also have mobile apps on, their, on our uh, attention. Mm, great. Yeah. Just a, another quick follow up to that. Uh, not on this project, but we do have uh, a number of projects uh, kind of talking about global in Africa, where mobile phone use is much more prevalent than computer use. So that's basically adding in the lessons learned from this dashboard and incorporating that into that project is something that um, we're, we're trying to do kind of in that output. So that, that may result in some sort of app uh, that we could use for dissemination of air quality data. Okay, great. Uh, well, yeah, thanks again to Rajesh, Forrest, and Jen for just a really uh, engaging seminar, and uh, thanks to the audience for great questions too. So if you have any additional questions, 
Uh, you can reach out to any of these three um, or, or reach out to me, Jared Lee at ucar.edu, and I can connect you uh, to, to them as well. Uh, but yeah, let's give our speakers one more hand. Thank you.